Um, T Torsion says Alze versus Spencer when Blood Sports. Uh, okay, I will not read the rest of your super chat, but uh, Alze versus Spencer may never happen. Uh, back in the days okay, of the house. Okay, there you go. Uh, we have finally uh, reached function. I think it was on my side in the end, so that's why you weren't hearing me. I had to restart the window for some reason, but I was answering a super chat about you versus Spencer, and I was explaining to T. Torchon, uh, back in the days of your rise and my rise at the same time, uh, Richard Spencer had just decided that he didn't want to talk with you. <laughs> And uh, it seems to be still the position. Well, it was funny. He didn't want to talk to me. And his main reason was he didn't like the way I dressed. Like yes. he made fun. Of, he said, I dress like a trucker and I wear sunglasses. And like, what, what, is, what do I think I'm doing? And he went in this like, it was in a Twitter DM. He went in this like two minute rant about the way I dress. Yeah, personally, I have never revealed the, the, the tenor of my discussions with Richard on this because this when is already I speak public. to public it, uh, it, it, It's already public. That's why I don't feel bad about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So so I can confirm what I was saying this uh, the, based on DM conversation with Richard. He doesn't like the looks of us. <laughs> <laughs> How are you doing, Alze? I am doing great. I'm doing really great. I... I I didn't take such issue with the with what I mean. Richard seemed to have kind of gone off the deep end a little bit, which I didn't really get. But there were, first of all, there were a lot of factual things he said that were wrong. But regardless of the factual things that he said that I considered, like they're, they're just historically inaccurate. But at the same time, then he went into a thing about how he's never been an ethno nationalist. Like Mister Ethno State Richard Spencer has never been an ethno nationalist. Then he went into Israel can't work because it's Jewish nationalism and Jews are two different types of people. Then he went on to say he wasn't an ethno nationalist because what he wants is a white ethno state of different white ethnicities that are all different, that are going to rise out of the ashes of America, just like Israel rose out of the ashes of the Ottoman Empire. So he was basically saying he doesn't believe that Israel can work in any way, shape or form but it's exactly what he wants for his own people. Well, I want to de-entangle some of the stuff because when I saw that you, you made a stream about it, I've reviewed the whole video uh, between me and Spencer and I, I've re-listened to what we were saying. And I have to say, I don't see any factual error in there. And I think that a lot of the double standards you're trying to call out are really not double standard if you understand what he meant. Um, when okay. we started saying that Jewish nationalism is a contradiction in term, uh, we didn't mean that it's not a immoral, uh, good for the Jewish people to have their right. To, you know, we understand that a Jew wants to live in a Jewish state. And I don't think th this is not what Richard was saying. He was not saying we should deny them the right to do so. What he was saying is fundamentally, well, say it doesn't up. work. No, but he, he didn't say we will we will uh, keep them from doing it. Yeah, he did. He said he wants a one state solution of ah. which the Jews have no sovereignty. But this is what I want to de detangle a little bit because first of all, he's not saying the Jews cannot want their own nation. He's saying factually, uh, f first he's saying fundamentally Jews are opposed to a lot of stuff. Uh, they are opposed to Catholicism. They see Jesus rise. They say, no, that's bullshit. And, and, and you see their behavior in leftism, feminism, LGBT. It's always an opposition to the established order. So there's this first layer of like principally Jews have not evolved to be in charge of their own nation. They have evolved among other nations. And it's, it's a, it's very non-Jewish to want a nation. So that's the first thing. The second thing uh, that I wanted to go on, you just said, you just said it and I wanted to push back on this. You said that he wanted to deny, okay, yeah, because he, he suggested an international intervention that would essentially dismantle Israel as a Jewish state. Uh, it's not, it's not 
he's not saying this on the basis that the Jews are not theoretically entitled to their own nation. He would be doing it on the basis that the Jews have proven in their particular behavior in Israel that they would only allow a system of oppression against others. In other words, he's saying the, the, the facts of history are that the Israel states exist in the oppression of the Palestinian people, and in this particular implementation of a Jewish state, it is a failure. That's what he was saying. Not that we couldn't think of Jews potentially having their own land elsewhere, but that given the humanitarian oppression that we see, it's not a good idea to continue the experiment. So because of the made-up oppression that he sees... The country needs to be dismantled, but countries all over the world oppress other people, and no one's calling for the dismantlement of their countries. Israel has well, achieved an advanced economy in 70 years, the likes of with con which countries who have been around for thousands of years haven't accomplished. But for some reason, their oppression of a made-up people, by giving them their own part of a made-up country, is somehow worth denying them a country of their own. Well, uh, first, I, I want to push back on everything you've said. <laughs> You're okay, stacking stuff I mean, in you my mind. You put up that map yesterday, which was complete and utter bullshit. Before yeah. 1948, there was no, 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 no country no, no, no. of Palestine. Let, let me at least address what you've already said. What I'm saying is you're stacking three or four points in my mind, and it's hard for my memory. Okay, Please, feel let's free. first address this claim that Israel has developed a great economy. Let's face it. Okay, I'm not saying that Israel is absolute shit all of the entire planet but israel is a country that has a business size of 403 billion dollars you are five times smaller than the shit all i live in which is canada so mm -hmm. can let, let's just be clear here at one-on-one -on -one, mano at mano if Canada puts all of its economic force in military and Israel does the same, Canada can own you 5x, okay? Let's just put things in perspective here. Israel I, is I'm a great country. You, you, point, you, so please. Well, it's because you keep dropping that bullshit that, that comes from the Bibi Netanyahu pamphlet that Israel is a great center of economy in the world. All of the corporations are super happy to go Israel to, to go to Israel to benefit from the Jewish greatness and the, I just wanted to be clear. Israel is not a super economic force. It's five times smaller than Canada. Fucking Canada. Okay. Well, number one, Israel, I don't know of a single major corporation that doesn't host its research and development in Israel. So what are they doing it there because they feel like it? Like there, there's no actual purpose to them hosting all of their research and development in Israel? I mean, you can find uh, dozens of corporations who go live in shitholes in, in some lost country in Africa just because there are diamonds there. It really doesn't mean But they don't host their they don't host their manufacturing there. They host their research and development. Their inventions yeah. come out of their Israeli research centers. But what I'm saying is whatever manufacturing you think that there is in Israel, it is five times smaller than the shit all I live in, which would have, which would only, have a difficulty uh, invading an empty country, to be honest. Canada would, would actually, Canada would shoot itself. The soldiers of Canada are so incompetent. They would shoot themselves trying to invade an empty country and were five times bigger than you. Five times bigger than us population wise. I'm, I'm really not understanding what you're saying. No, no. Economy wise, dollars for dollars, economic production. Economic production that you're five times the size of Israel, but you've been around for double the time and have five times the population and you have natural resources. Israel's economic production is based on research and development. Th those are all things I really don't care about. I just wanted the facts to be laid out. Uh, but that is where... in fact. That is, in fact, that Canada is 1.83 trillion in GDP in 2019. 
It also has one of the biggest countries in the world, landmass wise and natural resources. Saudi Arabia is also huge in economic development because it has oil. It doesn't mean that it accomplishes anything. All it does is dig into the ground and squirt it out. So I'm Absolutely. just saying that, that you can't you can't say that because they have dollars from natural resources that they have some kind of benefit that Israel doesn't have. I'm not saying benefit. I'm just saying when when you do the apology of Israel and you you I'm kind not doing of an elevate apology to it. I mean, I saw on your stream yesterday, or was it this morning? Uh, Good morning. You were like the, all of the corporations in technological development; they all want to go into Israel. Uh, it, as far as I know, Israel does not even surpass Quebec in terms of production of novel games, software, and technological stuff. Intel invented all of their chips in Israel. That was Israeli tech. Almost every military invention has either been invented or been made better in Israel for the last 30 years. The Americans shipped the F-35 there because they couldn't get even the helmets to work properly, and they got Israel to do it. The, F the F-15I is a fighter plane that's three times better than its American version. When Obama put sanctions on Israel to use Predator missiles, they created a missile that works five times better and 10 times longer. So the Americans asked if they could just start getting them made in Israel. Like, I don't, I don't know where you're saying that this, this economic output isn't there. The, <laughs> it's not there because the numbers don't lie. Uh, it's five times smaller than Canada in total economic output. Now, I don't want us to, to argue on this for hours because in the end it doesn't matter. I just wanted to set the stage that every time you speak of Israel, everything seems so biased in your mind. You seem to be coming out straight from a pamphlet of Bibi Netanyahu promoting uh, his country to uh, Which foreign companies. Which is funny because I hate the guy and I make that very clear to pretty much <laughs> oh, anyone you do? who would listen. <laughs> All right. So, I mean, I've forgotten the, the other points I wanted to address, but perhaps we can reset. And I will say, okay, so Israel is, is not a big thing uh, overall from an economic perspective. Uh, that being said, you seem to be questioning the oppression of Palestinians. Uh, what is your point there when you say a made up people? Uh, the Palestinians are there. There are human beings. Their vi the violations of rights that apply to them have been recognized by international organism. Uh, what is your point that the Palestinians are not legitimate people in Israel? They're not. There, there's, there was no such thing as a Palestinian person until 1964. No Palestinian Arab called themselves Palestinians before 1964. There was no country of Palestine that ever existed, ever. So I'm, I'm curious as to how they have a right to something they never owned, never governed, and never lived in until the same time that the Jews came and legitimately bought the land from the Ottoman Empire. Then all of a sudden, what, now they have a right to something they didn't build, they don't own, just because of their feelings, which is something that, that both of you said constantly, but they have this feeling of home for it. They have this longing for it. Well, there's a lot of things I long for that I have no legitimate right to. Um, so you are playing on the labels here. You're saying there was no one named the Palestinian before. Of course, because it was not named Palestine. But there were people who were there who were Arab, Muslims, and they have lived there since before the establishment of Israel. Can we agree there were two on that this? Lived there long before the establishment of Israel. There was what? There were Jews that lived there long before the establishment of Israel. There were plenty of Jews that lived there. Yeah, let's let's have a look at the Wikipedia. Early Ottoman era, the 16th century. Muslim, 12,000 inhabitants of Jerusalem. Jews, 1,900. Christians, 2,000 approximately, totaling 16,000 population for Jerusalem. Do you recognize okay. these numbers from the 16th century? Sure. So it's clear that the Jews were there, but they were a minority. So in the 16th century, they were a minority. So what? Yeah. So don't and come here and city. tell me that there's no such thing as the Palestinian people. But there isn't any such thing as the Palestinian people. 
They, well, they you want to give it another Empire label? Go Empire ahead. Empire. But I'm talking about the human beings and their descendants. They were there. I call them Arabs In if you'd city. like. One city is what you're talking about. You're not talking about an entire country. You're talking about one city. Well, it, it gives me a clue about what was around. They were being governed by the Ottoman Empire. Uh, let me list you some of the managers of this region under Ottoman rule. Abdullah okay. Pasha Al-Zam. Jan Birdi okay. Al-Ghazali. It sounds pretty Arab to me. It sounds like they were there. Those actually aren't Arab names. They're Turkish names. But Yeah, but they, they were... They were they were renovating mosques. They were from families that were involved in religious schools with the mosque. Uh, don't call it the Palestinian people if you don't like it, but don't tell me that this doesn't exist. You're talking about one city. As I said, Mark Twain went there in 1861, said you can walk the in managers, 10 miles in any direction and not The managers I just named were not mayor of the city. They were administrators for the entire region that today would be called Israel. No, they were the managers Ottoman for the entire city, which was called Lower Syria, which stretched from Syria to Jordan to Israel to Lebanon. So well, you mean two managers of an area the size of roughly the United States. I could name other. There's the full list here, but they say John Berdi Al Ghazali was the first governor of the Damascus province. The Damascus okay. province Damascus is being in Syria. Well, look at look at the region here. This is what today would be called Israel. Okay, and if you go back to the 16th century and you look at who was the governor of Canada, you'll find probably an Indian name. And so what, are you saying that it's completely illegitimate for Canada to be Canadian? No, I'm saying I would be kind of a extreme asshole if I was to come here and tell you the Native American people doesn't exist. It's a made up people. They never had any nation they and never had any legitimacy here. And too bad they're gone now and it's ours. I would be seen, rightfully so, as an asshole colonizer who's applying a double standard to others that I can't apply to myself. You're applying it to yourself. You live in Canada. Canada is a country of colonizers that came to a country and expelled its inhabitants. Exactly. And I'm not denying it. You're denying your own genocide. I'm not. There is no genocide. What are the people that were killed? What are the a genocide people where people were... grows every year? It's a pretty shitty genocide if you don't lose population ever. Uh, yes, a, a people can grow. A people can grow in total population while losing some of its people, while being the subject of a violent genocide. Because by your standard, no genocides exist. Uh, you'll go to World War II and you'll see that. Jewish population rise across the world. Does that not mean that they were subject to a genocide in Germany? No, because a population can grow while genocidal force are being applied to it. Uh, let me list you some of that violence, which was recognized uh, in by international uh, institutions. The Israeli government continued to enforce severe and discriminatory restrictions on Palestinians' human rights restrict the movement of people and goods into and out of the Gaza Strip and facilitate the unlawful transfer of Israeli citizens to settlements in the occupied West Bank. Uh, call it what okay. you want. This is violence and this is pushing out of a people from a place where it legitimately exists. No, it was not pushing out people from a place that legitimately exists. The settlements actually didn't displace anybody. They were made on open land. And they didn't push out anybody for it. They just built their own towns in that empty land. <clears throat> Israeli forces stationed on the Israeli side of the fences separating Gaza and Israel responded to demonstrations for Palestinian rights on the Gaza side with excessive lethal force. Between March 30 and November 19th, security forces killed 189 Palestinian demonstrators, including 31 children and three medical workers, and wounded more than 5,800 with live fire. Okay. You were talking about the people that were sending over bombs on kites and balloons and Where the threatened to sent storm the cities in Israel and kill all the inhabitants. You so, have no I, idea I, of that. They were shooting in random crowds. 
When is violence allowed then? When is violence allowed? Oh, it is allowed under uh, self-protection, self-defense. Uh, but let's not make the case here. You don't have a case that there's no violence being committed against the Palestinians, right? I didn't say there was no violence being committed against the Palestinians. Okay, so there is. And since it has the effect of pushing out Palestinians, because many Palestinians decide I can't live here anymore, since many of the uh, of the ancestors, we could call them, of the traditional Palestinian people throughout the generations have been moving out of Israel due to this violence. I call it ethnic cleansing. Ethnic cleansing of Gaza when Israel ev evacuated Gaza in 2005. There's not a single Jew that lives there. Uh, uh, how, the, how does the fact that no Jews live there change the fact that it's an ethnic cleansing through violence, intimidation, and deprivation of basic human rights. It's not an ethnic cleansing of anything. There are plenty of people that live there, and there are plenty of people that have always lived there, and there are plenty of people that are going to live there. They took all the ethnic Jews out of there. So yeah, there was an ethnic cleansing of Jews from Gaza that was done by the Israeli government, but there was no ethnic cleansing of Palestinians from there. So in your view, it's not ethnic cleansing because we didn't send Jews to replace them? It's not ethnic cleansing because the Gazans aren't leaving. Where are they going? Oh, well, many of them through the generation, you, you recognize yourself, many of them had to leave Palestine. Where? When did they leave Palestine? Well, you told me yourself that many have left to Syria and to other Arab nations. They went to Syria and other Arab nations in 1948. Yeah, exactly. There you go. During a war. Yes, they were pushed out by war, like many, many, many populations subject to ethnic cleansing. So the Israel, when they were attacked by six nations, they were ethnically cleansing the nations that were attacking them? Well, let's not mix things here. You are bringing the subject of this war by six nations. What's the title of this war? Was it the Six Day War? War of Independence. The War of Independence. Six nations. And why did this attack happen? Israel declared a state. They accepted the UN partition of Palestine. The Arabs did not accept the partition of Palestine and went to war. Absolutely. In what year? 1948. So in 1948, there is an event in which uh, what is offered to Arab nations is not satisfying to them, and so they attack Israel. So it's a contingent on them. I, I really don't even follow you. But in 1948, the Arabs didn't accept and they attacked Israel. Israel won the war. And you're saying that the, the rights of the people who fought the war on them should have been respected? Well, um, I don't know about this. Yes, I, in general, I, I, I tend to believe that people's rights should be respected, especially uh, citizenry, non-military, uh, how do they call them, civil populations. Absolutely. I do believe that their rights should be respected or that if there was a need for a martial law type of interventions by now, six, uh, what, 80 years later, we should be done with it and the oppression should end. Okay. And how should the oppression end? Well, <clears throat> it could be by giving the Palestinian a legitimate state with all the tools that it needs, which, of course, Israel refuses to do. And we've seen it again well, with three the times. They offered them 98% of the West Bank, East Jerusalem. They gave them all the guns so they can establish their security forces. They offered them 100% of Gaza, and they offered them a land swap for the other 2%. And they were turned down in the room and not even presented a counteroffer. So I'm curious as to what is it that, that Israel can offer them that they feel they're in a position that they can tell Israel no and demand more? I think you're misrepresenting the negotiations that happened back then. Are you talking about the Olmert offer, uh, Abbas Olmert? I'm talking about the Clinton offer, the Olmert offer. Um, they they all offered 98% of the West Bank and 100% of Gaza and East Jerusalem. 
Yeah, and here I have the Times of Israel, and it says that Abbas was never shown a map, that he was shown a map, but he couldn't hold it in his hand, and that Olmert withdrew it and said, I'm not showing you the map, I want you to initialize your agreement before I give you the map. So it's a map that couldn't even be consulted. We we can't even know what this so-called 90 five ninety six percent of the territory was there was no way for him to tell and it's also false that he didn't do counter offers in fact the reports both admit that they have spent uh weeks after this offer discussing and that there were progressions in various discussions but we're talking about a refusal to someone who said i'm giving you 96 percent, but i'm not showing you the map well he just said he showed him the map you wouldn't let him keep it yeah, wouldn't let him keep it, wouldn't let him hold it in his hand. So, um, at this point, it's not, it's not a serious offer if you can't review for yourself, uh, what are the tricks that are trying to be played against you, right? I have no idea what the, what was going on in the room. I know it was offered because even a boss confirmed it. And that being said, uh, you, you were saying, Palestinian you were saying, what would the Palestinians be satisfied with? Uh, it's outside of my jurisdiction, really, because I have a respect for the sovereignty of people. And I think that the Palestinians only are the ones to answer this question. Uh, as far as my position on this goes, as far as I see that they are being ridiculed with these offers like Trump, I can certainly understand that they would refuse that kind of offer. And as far as my respect of their sovereignty goes, I will continue to denunciate human rights violation on these people as long as they keep going and as long as I see them happening and as long as their self-determination is being violated. Okay. I didn't say you're not allowed to call them out. All right. So what else were you taking issue with from yesterday? Uh, other than the things we've already discussed? Well, as I said, what I took the most issue was, was that Richard Spencer has somehow made it seem as if the country cannot exist in a way where it needs to be run by Muslims. And that somehow counter signaling that Muslims are being insulted and their feelings are being hurt from a guy who literally said that Constantinople should be ripped out of the heart of Turkey by white people and all the Turks thrown into the ocean is now saying that Israel is not respecting the feelings of the Palestinian people that they want Jerusalem and they want Hebron. That's what I took the most issue with. Well, I think that you took a lot of issue with the word feeling, but uh, I mean, feelings is all that matters in defining borders to the extent that uh, people will claim their sovereignty and their legitimate existence on some point on earth. And yes, it will be based on feelings, feelings transmitted across generations, feeling grounded in truth and fact about people's individual history. But personally, yeah, I think feelings, it, Richard is not saying to you, you should always listen to all feelings. Richard is just saying, look, here's a, a bunch of people who have a historical claim and they have the feeling that this historical claim is legitimate. And it does matter to some extent in determining where people even want to live. Uh, now, I think that what you're taking issue with, essentially, uh, currently the Palestinians, do they have uh, the right to vote? Yeah, they do. They can vote in their own elections. Oh, in their own elections, but not in Israel government. They're not. They're not citizens of Israel. They're not citizens of Israel. So, is it your impression that if you were to respect them as full citizens, that Jews could eventually, maybe in the long term or maybe in the average or short term, lose control of Israel as a fully Jewish state? Do I feel that they would lose control as a Jewish state if they gave citizenship to all the Palestinians? Yes. They absolutely would. So ultimately, that is your fear. That, that is why you seek to justify these actions toward the Palestinians? That I fear that they would give them citizenship so they could vote in Israeli elections? Yeah. They're not Israeli. I mean, it, they're not Israeli. No, plenty of Arabs are, and they vote in Israeli elections all the time. In fact, their Arab party is the third largest party in Israel's parliament. 
So would you say, for example, that the Native Americans are not Americans? The Native Americans are not Americans? If they don't have American citizenship, no. If they do have American citizenship, then they do. Okay, but let, let's say I was to deny the citizenship to a couple of Native Americans. Would you say they don't have a legitimate claim to citizenship? If you are the president of, of this land you're talking about, that you denied them citizenship? Yeah. Okay. No, let, let, let's say I'm the president of America, and let's say there's a bunch of Native Americans, uh, they are on a reservation, and I, 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 I'm annoyed at something they've done against me, and I say, uh, you guys, uh, I remove your citizenship. Would there be something they illegitimate in, in your view? They've never had okay. citizenship. Okay, but suppose it's a bunch of Native Americans who's never had it, and suppose that we're in the 17th century and we're establishing the English colonies, and I say, you guys are Native Americans, you're not true Americans, I'm not giving you citizenship. Do you think it's morally okay? That is what happened. It w It's what happened for a while, and eventually we corrected that because we felt bad about it, right? You mean after they took all their lands and gave them reservations, which is exactly what you're claiming that Israel is doing to the Palestinians? Yeah, to, to be clear, I'm not trying to do a moral display here because I'm against the way Native Americans were treated by Europeans. And I'm for absolute reparation in the form of large concessions of land. I'm trying to get to you because you seem to be treating these questions differently. I, well, I mean, I don't agree with you on the reparations to Native Americans, so we could just have a difference of opinion, but... We do. No, we I do don't be believe that, that non-citizens yes, should be given the right to vote because they want to. Okay. Um, so when I look at the Balfour Declaration, I, I find that your position is essentially not within the spirit of the Balfour Declaration. Let's read what was in it. His Majesty's okay. government view would, would favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavor to facilitate the achievement of this object, it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine." The, the okay. non-Jewish communities that you just said, that you just denied the existence or legitimacy of, the Balfour Declaration was taken with the understanding that the existence of a Jewish state would never hurt the civil rights and religious rights of the others. Could we agree so that this part of the Balfour Declaration was violated? The Balfour Declaration isn't what gave Israel the right to, uh, to declare its own state. The Balfour Declaration was rescinded. The The British <clears throat> to put out a white paper that rescinded it completely and stopped Jewish immigration 100%. It was the United Nations that Britain turned the mandate over to when Britain said, we've had enough of this. We don't want to try to get in between the Jews and Arabs. Let's give it over to the United Nations. And the United Nations were who partitioned Israel into Arab and Jewish lands. Um. <clears throat> The Balfour Declaration was definitely part of the history that led to Israel in its current state. Now, you can argue that there were legal supplements after and that eventually, yes, it's true. It, it was not the case of the British. It was rather the UN that was in charge of all this. But for a long time, it was a thing of the British and a, a desire of the British government to make this thing happen. And then they rescinded it. Long before the United Nations Declaration, they issued the white paper, said no more immigration, no establishment of a Jewish state. They established Transjordan in half of mandatory Palestine. The white paper basically nullified the Balfour Declaration. The Balfour Declaration was a gift that they were supposed to be giving to the Jews for fighting with them in World War One, but they rescinded it. And Britain doesn't they have a right to give something. They rescinded it when? They rescinded it when? I think in 1929 with the white paper. Yes, so we're talking about 12 years of support for this, which continued into the Sykes-Picot Agreement. The Sykes-Picot right. Agreement was a 1916 secret treaty between the United Kingdom and France with assent from the Russian Empire, dividing the spheres of influence in the Middle East. 
Yeah. So there That's has been the English Jewish energy people. behind the realization of the Jewish state. But I'm saying they rescinded the Balfour Declaration. The Balfour Declaration came out matter. after the Agreement, and they rescinded it. They issued a white paper saying they weren't going to allow any more Jewish immigration. That was in the late 20s. So what happened in 1916 is irrelevant. It doesn't matter to me. The only thing I wanted to hear from you is, do you think that the current behavior of Israel and, and the one from the last 80 years, to be honest, that it is in violation of the original spirit of the Balfour Declaration? I think it's in this. Is, do I think it's in violation of something that I just told you was irrelevant? Sure, it's in violation of, of the Tooth Fairy and Santa Claus, too. Okay, well, I just wanted to, to make sure that we agreed on this. Uh, so essentially, by the standard of Western involvement in the founding of this nation and the contribution of Western society to this nation, <coughs> you guys have gone on a tangent that we don't You like. guys don't uh, live there. So what? It's really you guys, I don't live there. Well, yeah, yeah, you guys, uh, the Israelis. Uh, the Is Israel has taken a direction that we did not wish from the onset. We thought that there would be a possibility of a Jewish state under which uh, the Palestinian minority would live peacefully with the Jews. It didn't happen. And this was the message of Richard yesterday, really. But I'm saying in 1947, the United States partitioned the land in half and gave way more to the Arabs than it did to the Jews. And then the Jews accepted that partition and the Arabs went to war and lost. When you go to war and lose, your legitimate rights don't start triumphing over shit. When you lose wars, shit happens. That's called life. Well, um, you have this way of inserting who began the attack and it's always someone else than Israel. Uh, do you deny that there was a lot of fighting by the attack? What? Sorry, we didn't hear you. You just said that I, I'm sorry, like you're, you're claiming that I'm saying it always was someone else attacking Israel, and it was. That's the historical record. Well, uh, do you recognize that before this war, that there had, there had been a history of perhaps more than a decade of Jewish terrorism against Britain forces located there and against Arab uh Arab uh, settlements or military positions or simply Arab populations. I don't recall hearing anything about terrorism against Arab populations, but there were definitely terrorist attacks against Britain. Definitely. So we agreed that uh, in, in this partition that Britain decided as it was leaving Palestine because it was becoming too much of a problem for them, uh, the event of an attack of the Arabs against whatever it is that you had in terms of territory is not the first violent event in this whole escalation. And you're saying the Arabs weren't violent? No, I I'm saying that you're trying to frame it as we, we were under aggression and they started it, when in fact it's an infinite amount of escalation from the terrorism that was committed against the British forces because the Jews were not happy with the Arabs getting their part of the country. Uh, ultimately, I, I can understand okay. that the Arabs perceive this, these acts of aggression. Okay. What? what you just said is a complete misnomer. The, the, the British were not attacked because the Arabs didn't like what they were offered. The British didn't offer anything. The British were attacked because they stopped all Jewish immigration and said there won't be a Jewish state. The terrorism forced Britain to leave, which they then turned the mandate after that over to the United Nations, who partitioned the land. There was nothing about the British giving the Arabs anything that pissed off the Jews. The British well, stopped Jewish immigration. They gave them at least the absence of Jewish immigration. I hope we can agree on this. They didn't give the Arabs anything. They gave it themselves. They were the ones who were administering the area. Well, my understanding from this, Britain increasingly began to see its attempts to suppress the Jewish insurgency as a costly and futile exercise, 
and its resolve began to weaken. British security forces, which were constantly taking casualties, were unable to suppress the insurgents due to their hit-and-run tactics, poor intelligence, and a non-cooperative civilian population. The insurgents were also making the country ungovernable. The King David Hotel bombing resulted in the deaths of a large number of civil servants and the loss of many documents devastating the mandatory administration, while IED attacks on British vehicles began to limit the British Army's freedom of movement throughout the country. And you're going to tell me that you want me to be morally offended that the British authority decided let's stop Jewish immigration until we figure out what the heck is going on here? I, I think it's pretty understanding given the terrorism they were subjected to. They stopped Jewish immigration before the terrorism. When did they stop Jewish immigration? I think it was in 1929. All right. Well, I would need some references for this to understand uh, what is going on. But my point is that any any Arab aggression that has happened after these times, you won't convince me that it's the first event in in an on, in an escalation. What I see there is a deteriorating country one where violence is omnipresent and one where I wouldn't assign the blame of starting it to any party. I'm saying when the Arabs, when the Jews declared their state, the Arabs declared war, officially declared war and invaded the Jewish part of the country with the intention of killing everyone in it. It doesn't matter what led up to it. It matters that there was a declaration of war that declaration of war was met with war and they lost. Yes, uh, vis visibly they've lost since uh, Israel still stands. Uh, that being said, as far as I'm concerned, as a Canadian looking at this, um, it's an aggression country versus country in which I have neither interest in Israel nor in the Middle East countries or the, or Egypt or any of these countries that participated to this. So what I see this is, okay, an outside event of war in which I'm not involved. I would hope that's the way that you would look at it. I wish that's the way that all Western countries would look at it. Yes. And so I think that this was the spirit of the message yesterday by Richard. Uh, and you also mentioned on your stream that you felt there was a double standard because we were on the one hand saying whites deserve their nation and we respect their uh, sovereignty, but we don't respect the sovereignty of the Jewish people, uh, to be clear. And, and you made examples around America. You said, ha, how would you feel if I told you this offer for America and in which we would have to concede territory? I will say on this, uh, I don't deny the, the rights of the Jewish people to sovereignty. I just say, as long as it is done in the violation of human rights, I will be opposed to the project and I will denunciate it. And that's your right to do. I don't have a problem with denouncing whatever you want. I have a problem with involvement of Western countries in Israel's business as much as I have a problem if, with Israel involving itself in Western countries' business. I don't think that either one of them should be involving themselves in each other's business. And I've made that clear over and over and over again. Absolutely. Now, uh, you also mentioned that it was funny to see me and Richard essentially stand with the leftist journalist uh often the, the Bernie Sanders type of Jews that are uh, that are kind of less arkish and uh, and therefore more aligned with what me and Richard want. I know it's it's bizarre and I'm not saying you know we have to to trust the mainstream media at all time, but there is something on the Israel question where the far left uh, in Britain, and to some extent it's rising also in America progressively, the far left knows what what these things are. And I, I agree with the far left on this issue as it happens, simply for a just a, a historical contingency, which is that the far left developing in Western nations is very attractive to Muslim populations for many reasons, maybe 
Maybe they're less business minded. Maybe their cultural system relies more on family reproduction and they care a little less about business freedom and libertarianism and all that kind of stuff, which you see on the right. And so there is a marriage here happening between people like me and Richard and the rising Muslim populations of our Western nations, which forms this bizarre alliance, but which I understand fully because this happened uh, decades ago in France. Uh, and so it's, it's happening now in the English world. I'm, I'm just, uh, honestly, I'm trying to follow you. I, I'm, you're saying there's more of an alliance these days between people like you and Richard and Muslims? Yes. Okay, I'm, I'm not, I just was trying to clarify. That's fine. I mean, again, I, I don't want to tell you what to do, JF. I never have tried to tell you what to do. I don't particularly care. Like, if if when you said, I want to Quebec, that's, I don't know how you pronounce it, Quebecois? Or yes, Quebec. When you said that that's what you wanted as your goal, I told you that if that's your goal and your desire, then I think you should go make it real. And when you told me that you wanted an ethno state, again, I said, make it happen. Show the world that, that it's possible. So I, I, know, I don't think I've ever been one to deny anybody what they want in terms of their ability to try to reach for it. What, I, what, I, was, what I found funny was, was the absolute credibility that you gave to the left-wing media when reporting on the Middle East as when opposed to when you normally say that they can't be trusted on anything. Yeah, well, um, I'm not saying they can't be trusted on anything. Uh, I think that there are there are point by point considerations to be had, especially on these issues, which are inherently non factual. Uh, the whole issue of Israel and Palestine and legitimacy of people on a certain land, you'll always find facts that you can twist one way or the other, depending on your moral position. So on a kind of ideological basis and as a kind of uh, temporary alliance, uh, I think that me and Richard are essentially heading toward being Bernie bros for a couple of years, you know, uh, be low on the radar, uh, hang out with communists and maybe lead to the first step which allies us with the communists, which is a combat of the current world order, uh, which is more important to Richard and me than most people think. Uh, before we philosophize about the future world we want, I think that we can, we can reach a, a higher alliance temporarily with those who are pissed off against the current world order. I mean, if that's what makes you happy, that's fine. I mean, I could think it's misguided, but do you, man? <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. I, I, I was it, uh, it has nothing to do with Muslims, Jews, or anything else. Like, you know they'll shoot you first, right? Like, you're the, the people Muslims? they think are Like, Richard Spencer is the poster boy for who they would love to put in a gulag. Like, I mean, they, they like... Okay, maybe you can be allied. I, listen, I have I have friends, people in my Discord who are straight up national socialists, who we say, you know, we ally against certain people, and then one day we're going to find ourselves on the other side of the battlefield. But I'm just saying that if, if that's the part I just find a bit misguided, just because I don't understand, like they they despise you, like they they despise everything you are. I, I don't like maybe again, maybe maybe I'm just missing something here, but it just doesn't make sense to me why you would want to ally with people who despise you. Yeah, I mean, it may seem bizarre, but uh, but I mean, isn't it the case that the, the, the current uh, directors of the political correctness, the, the leaders of the, the globalist world order, don't they despise me, too? And in the end, uh, I'm not, I'm not talking to you on that. Isn't there an easier path toward peace with a Muslim who happens to dislike me because I eat pork versus a globalist control freak that is trying to control the entire world and that is trying to bend this world toward their will, allied with 
uh, the far left, allied with the LGBT activists, allied with people who are fundamentally in a fight against heterosexuality, when in fact the Muslims are not? I actually would completely agree with that, except for I, I just aren't the far left people that you're talking about allying with the, aren't they them, not the Muslims? Like if you were talking about just allying with the Muslims, I get it, but you're talking about like being a Bernie bro. Yeah, a Bernie bro. And, and Bernie has, has still kept his ball in front of this bizarre rise of a certain type of far left. And, and my, my thinking on this strategically is we can see in Britain, it's starting. We can see the Muslim population as strong allies in the fight for the preservation of an heterosexual, uh, family. And we see this in the clashes that they do in our own schools. They fight for, they, they fight against the LGBT propaganda and worldview in our own schools and they do it better than us. And so I see in the future that no matter how in the current times you will see these bizarre alliance between the Muslims and the LGBT activists in the long run, the, the Muslims will still be here in 200 years from now. The LGBT activists, perhaps less aggressive, perhaps, perhaps less entitled. I think that we say that on my, my Wednesday and my Saturday night show that I, that I do with TFM. I think we say that at least five times a broadcast that if you want to survive what's going on, ally yourself with the Muslims, like become a Muslim, do whatever. Like they're a patriarchal society. Patriarchal societies will always survive. So, so I, I get that. You're not saying anything I don't agree with. That is fascinating because instead of making a case that you should respect the Palestinians for moral concerns, perhaps I can leave you tonight with a thought. Isn't it better to respect the Palestinians out of purely strategic pragmatism in the future for your own existence? I do not believe that that would be in, in, in Jewish existence. I mean, in Jewish um, interest. And I, I, hear what you're saying. I just, I just don't see that as being. I don't see the Jews and and the Muslims as ever able to ally together against global homo. I just, I, I just don't see it as being a possibility because the animosity between Jews and Muslims is not the same as between Muslims and others. Wow, uh, this is very profound because uh, Jews have lived among Muslim communities for longer in the history of humanity than our entire lives, you and I. Uh, and so I, I think that peace is more possible than people make it out to be under the current confl conflictual stance. But in the long term... Uh, if if people respect each other, I think they could live together. And I think that if there is a country that where we could try it, it could be Israel. It could be a multicultural state in Israel, respectful of the rights of all. And everyone goes to their family. They all make babies. And whoever makes the most ends up dominating the country in a hundred years from now. That would be a beautiful vision of multiculturalism, which I hope sees the day in Israel. Just so you know, that's not so different from some of the far right in Israel, because if you gave all of the Palestinians that are living in Israel, not the ones that are living in other countries that would want to come back, there would still be, I think, a 10% Jewish majority. And the Jews are far out breeding the Palestinians and they don't see it as a threat. And they say they say, oh, they, there are some on the far right who say the best thing to do is apply Israeli sovereignty and just accept them as citizens. I, I don't agree, but that's what some people say. All right. I'll say thank you so much for coming. Uh, as always it, with you, it is extremely interesting and it was a very uh, tight discussion and I loved it, really. I'm, I'm glad to hear it, but thank you very much for, for giving me the time, man. Bye bye.